as a impact-driven business and a purpose-driven business, we aim for very high ambitions uh, while mitigating uh, all the risks uh, uh, coming at us. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I had the fabulous pleasure of speaking with Space and Matter, who are based in the Netherlands. I spoke with two of the founders. There's a third founder as well who wasn't present, um, but I did speak with Jid Hakau and Matein Paul. Uh, the third member is Sasha Glazel. Uh, their fantastic and very innovative business which really has a number of different tentacles in different areas of architectural process and design from circular area development vision making strategic design master planning urban development spatial vision nearing uh, community building sustainability works and i think what was really interested in this uh, conversation was we spoke about the ecosystem that they have developed, which they used to deliver self-initiated projects. So a little bit of background about everybody. Jid carried out his uh, architectural training both at TU Delft and SciArc in Los Angeles. Uh, Sasha studied architecture at RWTH, uh, Achen, and graduated um, cum laude, uh, and Martin completed his Master of Science at the Technical University of Delft, the Faculty of Interactive Architecture. In 2009, at the height of the economic crisis, they founded Space and Matter. They were united by the desire to improve the world for their children and all future generations, and their journey began with Waterboer Wonen, a floating neighborhood in the Dutch polder. This circular and innovative design not only won first place in national competition, but also sparked the creation of Space and Matter. And for over a decade, government officials, project developers, and community leaders have turned to Space and Matter for an array of innovative solutions to complex urban challenges. So in this conversation, we delve deep into the ecosystem and the different ventures that they have. There's basically five different companies and organizations which have been founded by these guys. Um, you've got Space and Matter, which is the kind of design, urban planning aspect. There's Common City, which is the real estate development aspect. There's crowd building, which is kind of co-living initiatives. Um, there's modular construction company called Boom Builds. And there's a nature restoration uh, organization called Sumo Walla. So they unify these five companies and use them to deliver these self-initiated projects. We talk a little bit about how they do that, how they navigate um, and find and develop uh, projects from start to completion. We talk about how projects are funded. We talk about the art, if you like, of being architect, developer and contractor. And I think this is, for me, this is this is such an exciting proposition um, of self-initiated projects where architects and designers are really taking the baton, really taking control of where their work wants to be going um, and having a vision for it and figuring out a way to have it executed and delivered uh, and also being able to enjoy the rewards of taking that kind of risk, the same of how a developer might be doing so. So sit back, relax and enjoy space and matter. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Matin, Tid, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Absolute pleasure to have you here. How are you both? Good. Thank you, Ryan. Pretty good. Honored to be here. Excellent. So you guys are the founders of Space and Matter. You have got quite an interesting array of services 
um, you, you kind of fall under the umbrella of master planners, um, vision planning, circular area, area development, a lot of high level strategic work that you were doing with, with um, collaborators and other consultants, um, a lot of community and sustainably led initiatives. Um, you guys were founded, when was it, 2008, 2009? 2009, we started. Excellent. And you've got quite an extraordinary array of projects under your portfolio. And I think one of the things that we're going to dive a little bit deeper into as well is this idea of the ecosystem and the other kind of five businesses that have been, some of them have been co-founded by you as well, or are they completely separate entities? No, we, we co-founded most of them. Yeah. Most of them. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Okay, so we can talk a little bit about that and that very unique um, business structure. So why don't we begin with how did the business start in the first place? What was the what was the impetus for actually founding the company? Well, maybe it's it's nice to go back to uh, when we started uh, uh, our studies in Delft. At least Martijn and myself. We have another partner, Sasha Glasel, but he's uh, German, so he did not study in Delft. But uh, at the first day of study, I uh, was waiting in front of the, you know, the, the, the faculty of uh, architecture. And then this guy approached me and he asked me, uh, sh should we register here? And I said, yeah, I think so. So we walked in together and that guy was Martijn. <laughs> so we, we really met at like the first day of, uh, of architecture in our <laughs> lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, after, after graduating, Martijn, uh, uh, he graduated a year before myself and went to another, uh, to an ar working at an architecture office. And um, uh, I also started at One Architecture, an office based in Amsterdam. Um, and uh, there I met Sasha, our other partner. And then one, uh, one Christmas break, we thought, Sasha and myself, why don't we just uh, start a competition? And uh, we did. So our whole Christmas was dedicated to pushing, pushing for the, the competition entry. And in uh, March of 2009, we uh, heard that we won the competition. Um, and uh, we thought, well, let's just then start a company. And then uh, I told Martijn. And maybe Martijn can tell us what he thought then. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, by the time I found out, like, uh, okay, these guys are off the hook. And we have been uh, drinking beers on Friday afternoons and we, we should start a company someday. But which day, you never know. And then for these guys, this was that, uh, that typical day in March to 2009, uh, which was actually at the brink of the economic crisis and the, the Lehman Brothers, yeah, at, great time to uh, et cetera, and the banking crisis. So I had a well-paid job, but actually uh, mm -hmm. slept over it for one night. And I thought, I'll quit my job. I think this is the time. I also have to get myself off the hook and join the ride with these mm -hmm. two uh, guys. Get to know uh, Sasha as soon as possible and already knowing Chirt uh, from the inside out. So that felt uh, very comfortable. So it was uh, actually the three of us uh, starting this uh, very adventurous ride in the midst of this uh, financial crisis. Yeah. And well, it's an interesting time to start a business. And for, for many people, it might seem like a terrible idea to start a business in 2008, yeah. 2009. But actually, I have a suspicion that if you can start a business in 2008, 2009 and survive for the first few years, then you've done the hard work of building up some, you know, well-deserved resilience and business <laughs> um, lessons. What was it like for those first few years? Obviously, you, you had this project that you were yeah, about well, to commence. The, the project was actually, so we, we won the competition. The, uh, it was a, uh, a competition about also, uh, we had to uh, make a vision for 500 sustainable homes somewhere in the Netherlands. Um, but uh, and we got, we actually got the prize. We received it at the MIPIM in Cannes, so the largest real right. estate fair in uh, Europe, I suppose. And uh, well, Sasha and I were there with the two of us, um, and we, we we saw that there were very little architects there, and it was only like real estate developers, investors, and uh, politicians and government people. Uh, and we thought, well, wh where are the architects? <laughs> And because we saw that this this Mipin place was the place where decisions were made, where the money was sort of flowing, right? Yeah. And uh, then we, uh, when we got back, uh, we thought, well, we should uh, maybe not start an office together with other architects, but we should sort of understand how this real estate development uh, world works. And the the good thing about the competition uh, was that we won uh, 50k of prize money. 
so that also gave us a bit of runway uh yep. you know for, for a year to just uh, find out if we could s- set up some uh, some stuff <clears throat> so that that was sort of a comfortable starting uh, position um but indeed the the, the financial crisis led us uh, you know n- no one called us in those times mm-hmm. in that year so we really had to come up with our own sort of ideas on how to start up projects and uh, well looking at how real estate developers initiate stuff that is what we thought uh, the way to to survive well, well, this is a very interesting kind of proactive approach to business development, which I'm always you know, very much excites me when I hear architects, um, designers kind of doing this rather than just waiting for projects mm-hmm. to come. And often many times when we wait for a project to come, somebody else has done a lot of the strategic thinking. And now your role as the architect, you've got to squeeze into some box that somebody else has been defined. So what were some of these insights that you were learning from the real estate world that kind of led you to you know, take more initiative with starting projects? Well, I, and actually on starting framing the question and properly understanding what is the uh, desire still there in society. Um, and because developers kind of halted their development aspirations, investors were not really willing to invest anymore. Banks were like almost closing office and not supporting uh, property development anymore. But we were still uh, facing lots of questions and we had friends and friends of friends and uh, babies were born here and there. So there's still the demand of relocating to a slightly larger house. And so this housing demand was still there. Um, And that actually led us to like finding where the actual demand is in society and then trying to frame these questions into potential briefings, which could eventually be a, a design briefing. And I think that's exactly what developers do and trying to grasp a certain demand and then frame that into a, a project definition and trying to solve that question by uh, by yourself. And we are lucky enough uh, to, to be skilled with a, a set of tools and creative uh, mm-hmm. uh, language and uh, the visualization skills and uh, imagination and vision making, etc. Um, so we started collecting those demands from our direct surroundings, our direct uh, uh, personal networks and actually started translating these demands into potential projects. And one thing led to another. It it was actually like almost unsolicited proposals that uh, grew into fruition and became projects. And uh, and that was our business development strategy for the first few years. But it has determined a lot uh, our DNA, which is uh, still inside the company and still um, Trying so, to frame the questions so, so, that are are in our direct environments and coming from ourselves instead of waiting for a question to come at us. So literally, kind of, you, you're scouting around, looking at different sites, visualizing potential and possibility for what could happen there, having an understanding of what you know what the market demands, doing some preliminary design work, and taking that work to other consultants, companies, organizations that could facilitate the, the building actually yeah. happening. Well, the, I think one of the best uh, examples, uh, and we actually all uh, started that like w- as one of the first projects, is the Suites Hotel. Uh, it's, a, it's a hotel in these little bridge guard houses in, uh, in Amsterdam. And we, we uh, heard that the, the, those little houses were running uh, vacant because the, the city would centralize the bridge, uh, at the, you know, the, the, the technical system for it. Um, so we thought, well, that would be a really cool place mm-hmm. to sleep. Right to to have, to spend the night as a as a as a tourist or as someone from Amsterdam. Um, so what we can do as architects is not just you know think of a great idea, but also translate it into something uh, visual so that we can show people and this is what we mean. And what we did with those uh, with those little hotel rooms, uh, we, we thought uh, w- w- uh, so we we uh, we call them suites, right? As in. Uh, Hotel suites, but it's also like the the candy in in ta- in yes. the in the city, right? So because they're all very special, they were uh, were built in a in a time frame of a hundred years. So and all by pretty cool architects. So what we did is we tr- translated all these uh, houses into candy together with a candy uh, shop, and then we went with a box of candy to the aldermen, so to the municipality, and and asked them like, can we use these uh, these these vacant bridge houses? Uh, to turn them into a hotel and we also uh, obviously needed a hotel operator for it so we approached them uh, and uh, some guy that helped us with all the permitting and stuff so uh, you know that that was sort of getting everything together uh, around an idea and around a sort of 
uh, well, if, uh, yeah, identity and and, and a nice uh, and, and nice visuals uh, to have a sort of package with everything you you need to do it, and that is all you know. That is taking initiative and, and sort of tying everything together. And, and, it, and were you involved? With, um, so the the people, how did you identify who would be the right people to take the projects to? Well, yeah, indeed. In this case, it's the property owner yeah, because it was existing property, but running vacant and then uh, being able to transform that into a new uh, function for the object to uh, to have a, a bright future again. Uh, so in the first instance, then talking to the municipality to find out, can we obtain those rights to get the transformation going? And then finding a hotel operator who is like crazy enough or uh, who has a certain appetite to run this difficult operation and because it's very high sympathy factor oh wow i can sleep in this unique object in the in the city of amsterdam surrounded by water but it's a collection of 27 dispersed objects and so from the operational point of view uh it's a pain in the ass so how do we target a hotel operator who's creative and unconventional and willing to set this up together with us and that's where we actually found our mm -hmm. partners from the um seven new things uh, and they've realized some unique hotel concepts and we just started the conversation and also showing the the box with candies and showing the city map where these objects are located and then imagining uh, or actually uh, sharing our narrative of our imagination how cool would it be waking up in this location or waking up in that location i go out for a coffee because and there is already a coffee shop in the neighborhood i can pick up a rental bike there i just go to the swimming pool that's already there so we really imagine the direct neighborhood to be at your service. And normally a hotel wants to be all the services inside the hotel, the restaurant, the swimming pool and the coffee shop, etc. But we believe in the local uh, context, that's your service level. You just need a place to sleep in the middle of the urban jungle. Uh, and they actually went for it together with us. And so, um, yeah, we were lucky enough finding the right uh, operator. And then things uh, move okay. forward. Yeah. And, and and do you end up creating a um, like a joint venture in these kinds of relationships, or do you take a much more traditional role as architect designer, providing those kind of services? Yeah, it's a combination. Huh? We uh, opted in for setting up the uh, the business entity together, in which we are still uh, okay. a small percentage shareholder. Uh, but of course, mm -hmm. in running a, uh, a startup business in our first few years, we also needed to make sure we can get our invoices in on our time spent and the services provided to get that properly paid. So it's a combination of both. Yeah. yeah. But it's also something that we learned al along the way. So uh, in, in another uh, sort of uh, business that we set up called We Build Homes, uh, we mm -hmm. did not uh, set up a joint venture. And that, is actually, that eventually became a, a sort of a problem. Um, right. So, so now if we uh, have these new sort of concepts and ideas, we always try to to really uh, make an entity, like a former entity, and collaborate in the proper way. So with shareholdership. This, this is absolutely amazing, and you know, it it surprises me that more architects aren't doing this because hmm. it because it's it's really like you know I've spoken to lots of um, you know architects about this as an idea, and there's only a handful that have actually gone out and successfully done what architects are actually very good at, which is being very propositional, i.e. you being able to find a site, think of a brief for it, think of how that piece of city could be used, and then actually go and connect with the right sorts mm -hmm. of people. Why do you think that this is a, a very challenging thing for lots of architects not and that they end up not doing it? And what made it easy for you? Or well, easier. Well, I think it's it's part of our education, you know. You 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 uh, also during university we never um, uh, were taught, uh, uh, you know, about uh, about business development or about real estate development, and those are things I think are crucial to learn. And uh, it's kind of weird. So if uh, you know, if if you would talk to a regular real estate developer as an architect, and then the real estate developer tells you, well, if you find a nice site and have an idea, just uh, come to me and I'll help you. I'll give you a commission. Uh, so that that is how you know how how we were also approached. And but now we think you, know, you give us a commission, <laughs> we, we we share the profits of the whole development, right? Because that's yeah. where the profit is in eventually yeah. making the thing and selling it. Uh, not in a commission so um but it, it's something you yeah you need to or at least we found out uh sort of how it works and that 
maybe that that is also uh, good to tell. Uh, when we set up our first office, it was we we rented it like a, a little workspace uh, at a real estate developer's office. So mm-hmm. we got to know these guys, and then uh, one of the one of the uh, juniors there, he left that real estate developer and started his own business. And then we started to collaborate, and he sort of led us in uh, in the development, and and in, in that way we we sort of learned how uh, project development works, how how to mm-hmm. set up. I don't know the English word, but you know the, the, your 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 costings and uh, and then earning stuff, and um, the what well, I think we needed that sort of uh, collaboration to uh, to understand how it works and to also set it up ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I think it also has to do with what's the value proposition you can offer, mm-hmm. and what is the the surface fee you're. Uh, taught to ask for that, and it, it's lacking in uh, in education that business modeling is not part of architectural education. And eh? we do three D modeling and uh, visualization, but part of education uh, should be about business modeling. Eh? How to make your value proposition stand out from the rest, and then question yourself: Is being paid by the hour the best way of? Uh, uh, capitalizing on the value you provide because we strongly believe in the amount of hours we spend or the value we provide sometimes is not uh, determined by the amount of hours spent. Uh, no, it, it's yeah. much more valuable than that. So it also starts with respecting and understanding the value you have to offer. And are we capable of finding a site, uh, detecting an empty building, getting the right mm-hmm. to transform uh, one of those empty buildings? That's already a very valuable uh, position to start from. Even bef- even before it's the so architecture it, it, still has to start, yeah, it, yeah, it's it's so interesting actually that those sorts of things become enormously valuable to a client, or even for example when you're working with developers. I mean, I've spoken to many architects before who, very you know, very simple premise. They might structure their fees in a way where they delay getting paid early on, and they negotiate kind of either an equity slice at the end or a much, much higher fee because they've got the ability to postpone their fees until they've got planning permission, for Mm -hmm. example. And, you know, there's no design involved in that, but it's very, very valuable to be able to do that for a developer. And you can treble your fees in some cases being able to do it. That's also an instrument. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I, and I think that's that's really interesting because when you when you start looking at the the property world, the real estate world, it's very creative in the way that they structure deals and being able to understand where the as you say where the value proposition is for the mm-hmm. client for the developer, like where are their pain points, what what are they really struggling with, and actually it's not always a design solution, but rather a way that you're designing the way that you provide the service or in this case, you know, how you might be structuring yeah, your fees. And how, can, how can we contribute to lowering the risk? How can we contribute to uh, spending less, less cash flow upfront and yeah? like understanding the way property development uh, actually works and then tra- trained as creatives, we can also work with numbers. We can also work with cash flow schemes yeah? as a creative. You can also ask questions like, why is it like this? And maybe, a trained mm-hmm. developer, development professional might not ask these questions, but uh, from an outside perspective and with a creative questioning mind, we can we can find new financial models which uh, they would not have thought of. And I think also uh, cre- creativity in the business modeling, in the development uh, arena, uh, comes at hand very, uh, very valuably. So is this how that your your service is kind of expanded then rather than just purely doing straight architecture that you moved out into doing more strategic vision aspect type of work? Yeah, well, actually, we so um, in, we were also asked by uh, how we started the, the sort of more real estate or property development things were also a bit of a coincidence that the city of Amsterdam was not able to get, you know, in the crisis times, get the real big uh, real estate developers uh, uh, eager to develop housing. So then the, the municipality decided to uh, give plots out to citizens. Uh, we, we call that CPOs. It's a sort of collective commissioning. Um, and we managed to win some of those tenders. And we were then uh, sort of guiding these groups of people. You know, we, we had a sort of collaborative design approach. We had our, our junior developer uh, friend uh, helping out with that stuff. Um, 
uh, and together we, we well we were developing for those people and that that led us to understanding how this whole process uh, works well I, I think indeed then where the municipality flipped the way of um, like like granting land to uh, the the people that still have the demand and which is the residents and developers were looking at the risk and the risk uh, in their appetite was too high but if we were still capable of clustering a group of future residents and actually do it mm -hmm. on a DIY uh, kind of level, uh, which helped us to increase ambition while lowering the risk. And because you have your future residents already on board in a very early design stage, but for a normal developer that would seem very labor intensive, yeah, Martijn, how do I have to manage like 20 individuals and, and uh, make sure that lands into a mosaic or a Tetris kind of configuration of individually designed apartments. That's a hell of a job. Well, indeed, it is labor intensive. But the fact is that for us, this is this is the way we work. You know, it's a lot of fun. We can increase ambitions. We can make projects even more unique and stand out eh? instead of uh, 40 apartments of uh, the same size and repetition is more leading instead of uh, customization. So for us, working with a group of individuals and making custom-made work times 20 or times 40 that results in a very special uh, collection of apartments in a unique building. So our, our work is way more fun. Yes, it is labor intensive, but if we get paid for the labor we do, we're also happy to, uh, to be well paid for the fun work uh, we do. And then the projects that come out uh, have a very unique um, way of standing out from the rest. And actually, that has helped us to understand, okay, can we standardize this approach and this way of working to make it less labor intensive to actually make this way of working more smart? Can we uh, actually start designing the tools? Uh, and because if we have to change the design process, but the tools are not there, then we have to start designing the tools to help us still make it into a smooth process. And one thing that came out of this, and so these businesses, they grow organically, uh, one platform that came out of this is crowd building, which is actually an online okay. platform uh, by which we aggregate people with uh, similar or uh, common denominators in their demand. Eh? How can we actually facilitate the process of individual future residents find their future neighbors even before the apartment block is there? So actually build the community in order to have the community build their own uh, housing block and then the interesting uh, fact that kicks in if you have a group of residents with a certain kind of common interest. Wow, how cool would it be if we could share a music studio? Oh, I'm fond of cooking. Okay, let's make a proper kitchen facility in the ground floor and have a cooking studio, which we can share. You know, we build uh, more social structure within the block. Uh, the residents are more happy and the architecture that comes out is more uh, unique. Uh, so and the, the crowd building platform is now a tool that's revolving around the subject of build your own collective and we'll step in as soon as the, the collective and the group of future residents is strong enough and the demand is clear enough, then we can help you find the site to translate your uh, demand mm -hmm. into uh, the, the future residents, uh, residency you imagine. So, so let's let's talk a little bit about this ecosystem, and it, this is what the original question was actually yeah, I was was, the, was was how 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 the services have kind of evolved um, into what it is that you're doing now, and kind of moving away from being straight straight architecture. And so, this ecosystem, you've got what is it? Five ventures that are, yeah. that are part of the the crowd building being one of them. Then you've got space and matter, common city, which is your real estate arm. Yeah. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. And then there's the boom builds and then Sumawala, yeah. which is the, so, so boom build is the kind of modular arm of it. And Sumawala is the kind of nature reservations or nature regulations. So do you want to can you talk a little bit about how they've all, the kind of genesis of mm -hmm. all of them, if you like, and, and how do they interact with each yeah. other? Yeah. That is what I wanted to say before. Uh, so while doing that, those uh, while guiding those groups towards their, you know, dream uh, like buildings, uh, we only got paid for the architecture, right? So we could only sort of give them the architecture bill. And then we thought, well, that's not smart because we are also guiding their whole process. We are sort of developer for these groups. So we should have a separate entity in which we can offer the process. And that is how how that started. So we sort of split I up see. our services into right. 
and eventually that is what Common City is now, uh, well, ha has become Common City. So that is indeed the, the real estate uh, uh, development part, but also still does a lot of this uh, this process um, coaching for uh, for bottom up uh, community driven uh, and led developments. Um, and then, uh, well, crowd building is then the platform in, we, in which we can uh, get these communities uh, inside and, and, and also uh, create new opportunities. Um, so that is sort of the aggregation. And then Space and Matter can do the design. The Common City can do the development. Um, and then obviously we thought, well, we also need to build it. <laughs> so that is where, where Boom uh, came in. But maybe Martin, you can tell a bit about how Boom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, it's uh, like organic growth. Eh? A new branch starts as soon as we see the need that we need the new branch. And eh? so, if we already have the groups and we have the process in place and the design can be delivered by Space and Matter, okay, eventually the project needs to be built. Uh, and in our ambitions, and we want to have this bio-based transition happening uh, rather faster and sooner. Uh, and we detected in the market that um, contractors were uh, not always uh, directly in for the appetite. Okay, let's put it up in uh, in uh, bio-based uh, materials and renewable materials. So we have to find out ourselves like how to get a, a bio-based building built, and we have to get into the inside of all of this. Uh, and then uh, gaining a lot of knowledge on this, we actually emerged that into boom builds, which is the uh, well, yeah, the, the knowledge barrier, let's say, if we want to have a bio-based building built, we uh, bring in our partners of Boom Builds and they can help us translate, uh, do uh, uh, cost quotations, etc., to eventually get those design buildings for the residents already in place and the process properly managed, also translated into a uh, renew renewable materials building. And that's how that's directly so, how the four uh, entities directly interact with each other. And so, in the ideal situation, is the four of them overlapping their circles and services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and does does one bring in business for the other? So Definitely. You, yeah. you, sometimes you might be kind of front facing with with the crowd building or the common city, for example, and then it ends up being, you know, it, it's a it become each one becomes a funnel for new work for the other exactly. services. Yeah. So you yeah. you you could say all four of them have a uh, individual front door, but the back office and the yeah. and they are connected on their uh, uh, back sides. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't. So, but the opportunities we generate with crowd building can be developed by Common City, who can commission mm -hmm. Space and Matter to do the design work, and eventually Boom builds to well, organize the the actual construction. So th there's there's an enormous amount of risk in this. So as you know, how how have you manag managed your own risk? And you know, for example, architects becoming builders can notoriously be very very difficult. How have you kind of mitigated your risks and the and how have you chosen the sorts of other people to be working with, if you like? Well, actually, Boom is not really a building, a, a builder. It's not a contractor, but they mm -hmm. uh, they did a sort. They have all the the uh, modular building systems that we uh, that exist in the Netherlands inside, mm -hmm. and they understand them and they translated them to a sort of parametric model in which they can very quickly see what sort of uh, building method would fit a design best. So it is more sort of a, a, well, a, a, co or a guide or a we call it a technical developer. Oh, for, I see. Right. Okay. So they're kind of like a, like a menu. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, sort of. But it, it sort of helps you make the right decision. And interestingly enough, uh, Ryan, you say there's uh, a lot of, apparently there's a lot of risk involved. But I think uh, what we try to do is actually to minimize uh, every potential risk involved. And for example... Mm. Having this community on board in a very early stage, which means your offset is already guaranteed in an early stage. So r risk couldn't be less. On the other hand, if we make yeah. sure that Common City as a developer is governing the process and maybe pre-finances some of that and has uh, its its name on the contracts and the contracts with the municipality or contracts with uh, future contractors, uh, we are in control of that risk. Um, the same as if we want to get this building built in bio-based materials, we have to be involved because we're 
uh, knowledgeable uh, on this subject and getting down to it at the bottom of it, we can control the risk and actually minimize these risks. So, yeah, obviously there is risk involved, but these entities help us to minimize this risk while realizing the emissions we have. And because indeed as a impact-driven business and a purpose-driven business, we aim for very high ambitions uh, while mm -hmm. mitigating uh, all the risks uh, uh, coming at us, and I think uh, that's a that's a unique um, combination we have uh, in house. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you you can see it makes a lot of sense that actually having these different arms to the organisation mm -hmm. actually provides a lot of support and foundation. And you know, there's multiple streams of revenue coming in. There's multiple avenues for business development and and projects to be being realised. You've got a kind of vertically <laughs> integrated. Set a suite of services as well. You can control exactly. things with a, with a higher level of degree, and actually, it's kind of you know when you think about it like that, then you start seeing that you start actually seeing how precarious and risky traditional architecture exactly, practice is. Yeah. Which yeah. kind of comes back to the other question of like why are why are more people not doing this sort of initiative based structure? Yeah, well, it, it takes an entrepreneurial <laughs> spirit and thinking outside the box and um, a yes, we can approach and because there, there's always yeah. lots of yes, buts and what if. And, and I think we are, uh, well, we have, uh, we have a, a good appetite of doing business and a strong belief in, um, in, in our yes, we can approach. And sometimes it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and let's get this started. Uh, not knowing what's uh, around the corner, but we will find out along the way and we will solve it uh, along the way. Yeah. But the, w w what also triggered us to, to, to become sort of, uh, um, uh, to, you know, to take more initiative was also a competition that we uh, worked on for uh, the library in Helsinki like a long time ago. But there were 550 entries. And we were, we were chosen by the, by the public as one of the top five uh, winners. Uh, but eventually only one uh, could win. So then it means 549 architecture offices have spent months to create that entry, which is a complete waste of time and work and effort and money. Yeah. And we thought then, well, why are we, why are we doing this, right? So what if we would in this time just have started an initiative, uh, we would have way more chances to make it a success. And if all the arch if all those five hundred and five hundred and forty nine offices would have done it, you know, <laughs> what you what you could have managed then with the time spent, it's it's uh, yeah, that there was a sort of mind switch for us. Yeah, yeah, and I think even continuing on this critical assessment of what is the role of the architect and what are those architects, and we are also architects. What are we doing, and mm -hmm. what is the status quo we're keeping alive by contributing to these ridiculous competitions? You know, the amount of intellectual waste yeah. that ends up in the in the trash. Can we not flip mm -hmm. that around and ask our architects and uh, befriended architects and colleague architects, what if you would decide not to spend your time on a competition where chances are ninety percent of losing? If we can flip it the other way around, rather commit two months of your time and actually. Uh, offer your time to design a ready-made and let, let's say uh, we've done this with WeBuild Homes and we're now also doing this with uh, the BoomBuilds proposition. And so mm -hmm. designing a generic uh, apartment block, for example, for a market demand, which we seem uh, to have a control over and which we see as relevant because we understand where the communities are and where the uh, demand actually surfaces uh, through our crowdfunding platform. So even before the question for an apartment block pops up, we should have some ready-mades, already pre-designed models by multiple architects who spend two months of their time investing in this ready-made. And then we can, in reverse, sell the architecture as a product. Yeah? Instead of selling the process and the architecture comes out, why not spending this amount of competition time in a ready-made apartment block and then finding the group and the location that fall in love with this prototype and then uh, only do 20% mm -hmm. amendments afterward afterwards to make it fit uh, and then if this model works you've spent your two month time but what if we we are capable of send, uh, um, replicating your ready-made maybe four times maybe even six or seven times that introduces a new revenue model which is more likely uh, to be compared with uh, product designers and you get a, a license fee or a royalty for every time yeah. we're we've been capable of selling your design 
uh, and we will ask you to do the amendments on uh, on a fee basis. And that's all. And it, it, that's it, so interesting. It starts with with Love a critical it. reflection on on the role and position we have, and why are we not the yeah. first ones to change this position and actually flip the coin and uh, change the game. That's such a lovely. That's such a lovely business model to, you know, actually doing the upfront work and then you're able to positioning yourself as you know, here's a product, here's something that's already got intellectual yeah. property inbuilt into it, and mm. it's easier to sell to a client. It, it can appear a lot less risky to a client because they can see something exactly. there. They understand. And then yeah. you, you get to control the shots yeah. on it. Seems seems you very seems very outcome. logical, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Again, it's kind of, it's kind of like why why is this why is not, not more yeah, of this happening? Exactly. Well, that's the same question we have. In, in, and uh, in, in in terms of um, you know the the real estate aspects and being de um, developers, um, are all your projects kind of crowdfunded, or do you use private or institutional finance as well? Uh, most of and find, and find yeah, investors. more more and more. And by the time we grow bigger, projects get slightly bigger. Uh, we mm -hmm. start to be relying a bit more on uh, uh, on f uh, venture investments or financial loans. Yeah? But uh, in, in the first 10 years, it was mostly crowdfunded and we funded from the inside out, from the uh, direct mm -hmm. demand and the people uh, becoming the future owners also chipping in along the way. Uh, but now we can speed up this process yeah? by saying, okay, we can pay uh, upfront the first 50% as long as you can commit and sign this intention or sign this pre-sales uh, agreement. Uh, and then we'll call upon your financial contribution in the second 50%, which, which actually speeds up the, the development curve. Has it, has it, does it make it easier when, say, for example, you're putting a scheme, a housing scheme through planning permission, for example, when there's multiple potential owners who are going to be living inside of the, 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 the housing block, as opposed to it being a completely private developer who's trying to squeeze you know, the land for every little last drop of value that they can get out of it. Does that have any kind of political sway to it or? Yeah, we think so. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I always thought that it's way uh, better to, to actually have the eventual end users or dwellers of a building, you know, also talking to the municipality and what they want. Yeah. I mean, they vote for these people, right, being in the municipality. So it's, it's a different relationship. And especially, you know, we, we are based in Amsterdam. This Amsterdam is obviously a city, but if we, we do these sort of projects uh, in the provinces, like outside Amsterdam, they are a bit, you know, like, what are these guys from Amsterdam doing here, right? But if we then manage to get a group, a local group uh, talking and, you know, be in the, the, you know, the, the face of the group or of the, the development, that's, that's a way better way of, uh, of talking. Fantastic. Very, very interesting. How did you then, because one of the most difficult aspects of this, I would imagine, is actually scaling it as an operation. And there's going to be a point where you three, you know, you had to get other people mm -hmm. involved. And with other pe when you start getting other people involved, there's a whole new world of challenges and complications and team building. H how many people are you now working with across these different organizations, these different businesses? Uh, Space and Manor, the architecture firm is always around 25 uh, people uh, with a bit yep. of uh, overhead in there. Uh, mm -hmm. The boom build uh, team is now around eight, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the developer, the uh, common city, how, how many, Martijn? Four, four people staff, excluding uh, ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, crowd and then the crowd building if crowd building is still small but we work with a lot of, of, of freelancers and uh, uh, you know uh, like not developers in the sense real estate developers but digital developers um, yeah. but there's like two there's now two people in the core team and 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 what were some of the challenges that you that you had to kind of overcome in terms of growing the the team if you like and finding the right people if any well on the one hand uh, it's useful and to have these um, um, branches and the independent branches, but still collaborating because they're uh, on the same route. Uh, that makes it manageable as a small nucleus. And like we have smaller teams that are kind of uh, self-governing and, and uh, 
We give them the responsibility themselves. We give, also give them insights into the smaller P&Ls, yeah, how to make this business work and how can we uh, uh, realize our revenue or our turnover uh, goals. Uh, and it's also what uh, the staff members like and to really be on board within the, uh, the venture itself. And so we want to prevent that we are building a pyramid with management and, man and, and coordination top down. It's rather a horizontal structure with these independent teams uh, <clears throat> strongly collaborating and finding the synergy on their back ends and having their independent uh, front ends. Uh, and I think that's a very... Uh, 21st century model and how to actually grow mm -hmm. a business by making sure you have smaller uh, smaller teams running as a business but as a total it's a bigger business it's a well that's the ecosystem uh, approach yeah um, so kind of like networked model for yeah, a business decentralized than, you know, the old yeah. traditional yeah exactly but what I really like about you know people uh, um, and, and the recruitment is that a lot of people that want to uh, uh, work at space and matter are really going for a sort of purpose they, they want to give a purpose to their work and that's why they want to join us so it's uh, that is pretty cool to see but in, but uh, uh, how we split it up now so we have three partners martin sasha and myself i uh, am now running the, the space and matter architecture business and doing a little bit of the crowd building stuff martin is uh, fully focused on the common city so running that and Sasha is uh, is focusing on sort of new concepts. So creating the new uh, business uh, ventures. So in that sense, we, we we split up the three of us and we come together, obviously, uh, well, multiple times a week to, uh, you know, to, to have a uh, picking, uh, picking each other's minds. Um, but that is how we set it up now. And uh, Martijn is doing recruitment for the for the development part. Um, mm -hmm. So this, yeah, it's a different, different breed of people that you need then. No. And that's uh, new for us too. And 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 how would you describe the purpose of the organisation? And has that has it has it changed from the initial inception back in two thousand and eight? Uh, well, I, I think it has not changed a lot. Like if uh, if we look back to the uh, look back at the, like the first project that this competition that we did was was all about uh, you know also transforming. Um, uh, in a very smart way, uh, agricultural uh, land in the sense that, uh, that the farmers could have uh, multiple uh, uh, revenue models and uh, make creating a community in the in the in the rural in the countryside. And I think uh, you know this this sense of community and not, not building architecture for the architecture, but building architecture to really create uh, a good society. That is still the the purpose we have, and that is uh, the you know the, the the a proper society is both socially driven, but also obviously mm -hmm. uh, well sustainably driven, uh, environmentally driven, yeah. and that is what we try to combine. Yeah, I want to add to that, and that we've become aware that uh, our project scale is actually the neighborhood scale. Yeah, we we can make one apartment block uh, uh, with close involvement with the future residents, make it uh, energy neutral, energy self sufficient, etc. But if we really want to uh, make an environmental impact and a social impact, our project should actually be governing a neighborhood scale where we can also have uh, principles of shared mobility kick in and smart grids on a neighborhood scale and even um, right. uh, decentralized sanitation. And that's like the, the economy of scale of these alternative systems to be uh, kicking in uh, not on a project scale, but actually on a neighborhood scale. And let's say 200 residents or 500 residents, which is a composition of multiple buildings, uh, living, working, and sometimes education and culture. And that on a neighborhood scale, we can really have uh, decentralized systems kick in and then they, they become independent satellites, harvesting their own energy, cleaning their own uh, sewage water, potentially growing their own food supply, uh, having a certain amount of... Uh, electrical vehicles which they share and servicing their own uh, mobility mm -hmm. demand etc so that already goes beyond architecture and going beyond the visual hardware it also requires organizing the software and the organization of flows and we like to contribute to uh, the the built environment as a circular built environment because that's the transition we we are facing or and the, the incorporation of the natural va values and making our uh, cities rainproof and uh, establishing them on the basis of renewable materials etc 
we can do that if we incorporate all these flows. And that's uh, also what Chert refers to as the first project uh, which made them win that uh, initial competition. I think it was a integral design approach on a neighborhood scale where all these facets uh, have been touched upon and unlocked the potential of really showing that one plus one is three. And sometimes you cannot do it just on a project scale, but on a neighborhood scale, you can. Mm -hmm. Amazing. It, so it sounds as well that actually the future of a lot of your business development might come from further collaboration or that the, the kind of where you're at now, you could actually, you know, if, if you do you ever have um, other other architecture practices, practices, for example, listening to what you guys have been doing and then they've got an idea and then they say, actually, well, it might be easier for us to collaborate with you guys because you've already got the infrastructure set up. Does that happen yeah. or would that be the next yeah. steps or... Yeah, that, that happens a lot. And also the other way around. We also invite uh, colleague architects to join us. Yeah? So, for example, with the, the ready-made concept and yeah? the, the boom builds approach, we've invited uh, uh, befriended architects to spend their two months of time on building this catalog of mm -hmm. uh, apartment blocks. Uh, and also the other way around, if, uh, if they're working on an assignment for a client and they feel they need uh, like our support in that, and we're uh, bi-directionally referring to each other's expertise and willing to join forces. Yeah. So we're very open for collaboration. Fantastic. Love it. Have you done any work outside of, uh, outside of the Netherlands? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we also really try to get more work outside of the Netherlands. Um, but, but not a lot of built, uh, work I have to say, uh, but yeah, we are we are now focusing on uh, on uh, the U.S. Uh, in, in California. We are trying to set up uh, some some new business uh, collaborations. Uh, the Nordics, UK was also always on our list, but <laughs> never managed to really you know uh, well get something off the ground. But we are we are very uh, yeah we, we we think the Netherlands is a very nice uh, and small country to sort of make the the prototypes right so we have this floating good neighborhood concept, yeah. it's, it's really good for concepts but scaling up and replicating mm -hmm. the concept i think our country is just too small so that's mm -hmm. why we are really looking for uh, for for places where we can um yeah, rep replicate the floating neighborhood or replicate the urban food hub or replicate the sumawala sort of uh, you know nature-based uh, 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 concepts um and that might and be in the US or, or elsewhere. Yeah. 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 We believe in that Amsterdam is a, a city that works for us as a incubator and to test, create and validate uh, our IDs. But eventually the Netherlands is too small to really scale up and replicate what we have to offer to the world. And so indeed we have a strong focus on the Nordics now that seems to be very receptive mm -hmm. and similar cultures and strong economies also. Yeah pushing towards a uh, more circular built environment, the sooner the better, similar to uh, California, mm -hmm. which is very progressive, but also and let's uh, yeah. open up the, uh, the collaboration invitation to uh, the listeners now listening to this podcast. Please reach, reach out to us and uh, become part of our network and let's, uh, let's create circular neighborhoods together wherever. Fantastic. Well, I'll, I will put all the details of how best for them to get in contact with you in the information of this podcast. So I think that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation. Really, really inspirational um, stuff there. It makes my hair stand on end hearing it. you guys have been so sort of proactive and taken the initiative. And, it's, it, you know, I, I really think that this is the, the future of how architecture practices should be structuring themselves. Because at the moment, there's 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 a lot of complaint within the mm. industry but it's usually as a result of us always doing things the same way we've always been doing yeah. them whereas actually we have the skills and the talent and the know-how to make the propositions of how the city should be be you know being created and we can have a we can we can create the seat at the table ourselves which is exactly what you guys have been yeah. doing so thank you very much really really inspiring thank you, ryan well thank you ryan for inviting us and that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment. 
except to help you be unstoppable.